Working in the NHS can be tough But at least you know at the end You'll have enough to live on comfortably From your pension payment But wait, there's something wrong With my total reward statement Where the hell have all my years gone? I've been working two decades You've only counted eight years of them But I filled in all the forms I've paid all my dues I just don't understand Why they're not being in use And all I want to know Is what I'll be owed So tell me what will it be PCSE And if I did my job As bad as you I'd be in prison Or up against a panel In front of the GMC I don't know what to do I've been PCSE NHS England outsource primary care pensions and services to Capita who made PCSE to modernise and save money we paid them £330 million in seven years and that's When we started hearing of mistakes and failures You would think with all the issues the partnership it would be through But the contract just got extended Cause they've saved money by screwing you And I know, I know we all deserve a second chance But it's like letting a rapist run a yoga class And all I want to know Is what I'll be owed But they can't tell me Cause they're PCSE And if I did my job As bad as you on for another year's three what are we gonna do we've been PCSE the bad news is if you live in Wales you've got PCSE too check your pension statements I'm so envious of my colleagues up in Scotland and in Northern Ireland I'm assuming you still have a functioning pension system. Good luck to you. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the Hot Topics podcast from NB Medical. It's Neil Tucker here to see you through the next few minutes or so to talk about what's new in general practice in the news and research. Let's not talk about politics. Even if you're listening to this on the weekend, it goes out. Whatever I'm saying is probably going to be behind the times. I've fallen foul of this plenty of times before. I'm not going to make the same mistake again. I was down in Abergavenny yesterday doing a face-to-face course. Very refreshing. Lovely to see everyone there. Thanks for a great day. And even between sessions, we had changes in government. Nevertheless, just because the current political party in power is currently imploding doesn't mean that government with a big G does not continue. And this week we saw a new report in the Future of General Practice published by the House of Commons Health and Social Care Committee. This is the review, the committee that Jeremy Hunt's been chairing for the last few years. Remember when he was the health secretary and we all didn't like him? And then he started doing this and started saying a lot of very sensible things about 
general practice, uh, a lot of sensible things about the health service and how we need to improve things, how it needs more funding, how it needs more staffing. For a brief moment in time, we all thought Jeremy Hunt was actually a great guy. And then he becomes the chancellor and immediately said, we're going to have to cut everything, including health. For a moment there, we'd forgotten what it meant to be a politician. Anyway, this report acknowledges that there is a crisis in general practice and that we should introduce measures, detailed steps to address this. How are they going to do that? Well, the buzzword of the day seems to be continuity. We've been hearing all about continuity in its research over the last few years. We talked about it on the podcast. Uh, Professor Martin Marshall, chair of the Royal College GPs for a little bit longer. He has quite rightly been a champion of this. What is the solution for the Health Select Committee? It is to introduce a measure, a national measure of continuity of care reported by all GP practices quarterly by 2024. By the end of the decade, they want all practices to go back to personal lists. Now, I don't necessarily have a problem with personal lists, but I think that's going to be pretty hard to implement in lots of practices. It's all pretty obvious what you need to do to solve that problem. It's to get people to work more. How can you get people to work more? You can reduce the intensity of their working day. Make it less awful and people will work. I'm not convinced in the report they've set out any mechanisms to actually do that. They have said an additional 1,000 GP training places a year should be funded. You've got to be able to fill them as well as fund them. They say... uh, NHS England should take further steps to address the administrative workload in general practice. I agree that there's quite a lot of admin in general practice, but quite a lot of that needs to be done by the clinician. So the best way to reduce the amount of administration that an individual is doing is to get them to see less patients. If they see less people in a day, then they generate and have to to correspondingly sort out less admin. What else? Ah, they say with no sense of irony, having just recommended that they introduce a a measure of continuity, they say that they should get rid of COF and the impact investment framework in England uh, because they've become tools of micromanagement. I think that getting rid of COF would actually be a terrible idea. I think that actually it has improved things. It has helped standardise things across general practice throughout the UK. If you get rid of it, then a lot of those patients will start slipping through the net. On the other hand, getting practices to have to beg for every scrap of cash is clearly really annoying and time consuming. And so maybe streamlining things down so that you don't have all these extras, all these impact investment frameworks and what else that whatever else they want to call it this year, taking that away and putting the money into core funding would be much more welcome. Hard to see how any of this is going to improve the underlying problems of the intensity of the working day and the overall level of workload. But I freely admit that I'm a pessimist and a pessimist who doesn't really like change very much. So maybe I'm kind of like the worst person to be thinking about these kind of things. I probably shouldn't be on any of these committees ever. I'm 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 happy on the inside. I'm like a happy pessimist, but a pessimist nonetheless. Moving on, the other big thing that's happening in general practice in the next couple of weeks, so before the next podcast will go out, is the changes to patient record access in general practice. So I was wondering what to talk about. I was saying this with my wife and she's like, have you talked about patient access? I was like, oh, right, that's happening. And she's like, yeah, that's quite important, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's right. Anyway, thank you to my wife who actually wrote a document on this for her practice and I'm shamelessly ripping it off. I mean, this is a fascinating area, fraught with danger for all of us. I think it's going to have a huge impact on how we start recording consultations because from November the 1st, all patients over the age of 16 will be able to see pretty much all of their medical records online. So they won't be able to see the tasks that we sent or major alerts. They won't be able to see anything from before November, but uh, and nothing from when they were children, but they'll be able to see everything else. So what you and I write in their notes, they will be able to read back at a later date. So there's two big risks here, of course. So one is for vulnerable people. So especially people who are at risk of abuse. So domestic abuse, modern slavery, people who are being coerced and controlled and who might gain access to our patients' records. 
we will need to be very careful about how we document what these patients are reporting to us. We obviously don't want to put them at further risk. And we might even need to think, particularly in the case of um, things like Uh, domestic abuse, we might need to think about dummy consultations because making a consultation invisible may be not enough. They probably know that that person has gone to the gone to the practice. They will be suspicious if there isn't some kind of consultation there. Clearly, this is a really big area that we're going to need to think about and get our heads around. And time is short now. I'm sure that many of you have been preparing this Uh, for quite a while now. But if you find yourself, and there is no judgment here, everyone's really busy. If you find yourself that you are um, kind of trying to sort things out in limited time, then the one thing that you need to know about is that you can essentially block or delay the start of this patient access by putting in a code on the note. So the code is 104, enhanced review indicated before granting access to own health record. But the really important thing to note is that this is only valid before November the 1st. After that, it won't work. But if you can get that done before, if you think that's important for your patient, then that gives you a bit of time and then you can review things that can be unfreezed at some point. The other risk is not about specific individual patients. It's more broad than that. So it's about the way that we use language and in particular, the misinterpretation of medical language. So for example, I think it would be very common for us to write something on the lines of patient complained of chest pain, let's say. And it's quite easy to actually interpret this incorrectly when you're not thinking of it from the medical perspective. Patients could quite easily read their notes as soon as they've gone home and say, hang on a second, I wasn't complaining about anything. I was just telling the doctor that I've got chest pain. We're going to have to be very mindful about how we use our language if we're not going to get deluged by shirty letters. The other thing we're going to have to do is just make sure we get everything factually correct. Uh, It's really easy to just write down the wrong duration that someone's had a problem. Or perhaps even it's quite easy for the patient to forget what they've told us. Either way, whoever is right or wrong, let's be honest, memories are not that great for any of us. It's easy to see that we're going to end up getting loads of requests for kind of minor detail changes. Welcome to a whole new layer of workload that didn't exist before November. Is this level of patient access actually going to be um, good for patients? I've always been in favour of people being uh, informed, people being allowed more information. I've always considered that the internet, it is a positive force for people. People can learn more about their health and that should help them. But I'm not so sure these days, to be honest. We've seen increasing levels of anxiety, of medicalization. As a race, this level of information doesn't seem to be making us happier, perhaps the exact opposite. And it's all very well giving patients more control over their health by letting them have all the information that is available on them. But actually, what can they do with that control? Unless you have a health system that can then meet the demands, the needs of the population that has greater control and wants to take greater control, then I think all you're doing is driving a lot of discontent and further anxiety. It's it's not going back, so this experiment is going to happen. Talking of experiments, we better get on talking about the research. And today we are going to have two papers, both with a cardiovascular flavour. So the first is from The Lancet, published today. That is the TIME study. That's looking at whether the timing of taking antihypertensives affects uh, your cardiovascular outcomes. And the second is one from the New England Journal of Medicine last week, which was a Danish study on cardiovascular screening. So let's kick off with the Lancet paper. The background to this, of course, is for several years now, we've had this idea that you might be able to improve blood pressure and cardiovascular outcomes in hypertensive patients by modifying the time at which they take their drugs, specifically if you get people to take those medications at night. So the reason is because naturally our blood pressure should um, dip overnight. It's classically highest in the morning, lowest overnight. It's a normal effect, but for some people they lose that 
uh, diurnal variation. And so these people that are, are not non-dippers are thought to be at higher risk of cardiovascular events. Therefore, if you give blood pressure medications in the evening when they're likely to exert the majority of the effect over the next few hours, then you can hopefully minimise the effects of that loss of that normal nocturnal dip. And studies have supported this before. I know we've talked about this on the Hot Topics course in the past. In fact, the first study was a smallish Spanish study called the MAPEC trial. That was 2,000 people. And that seemed to suggest that nocturnal um, blood pressure uh, medication taking was helpful. And then followed up by the Hygia chronotherapy trial, which published a couple of years or so ago, which was almost 20,000 patients. And that seemed to show an almost 50% reduction in the rates of cardiovascular events when you switch at least one blood pressure medication to the evening. Now you might say, okay, great, we've got some decent research here. Why do we need more? We've got our answer. Let's go for it. And I'm sure that lots of us have uh, maybe suggested patients take their medications in the evening now, but several concerns had been raised around the design, the conduct, and some of the results of the trial. They then did a formal investigation into it, and they actually didn't find any um, clear grounds for concerns. But off the back of this, the confidence in the reliability of the study had been somewhat diminished. So in steps the time trial, and this is good news for us because it is a UK-based trial, and it really has taken some time. This was started in 2011, conducted over to 2018. A prospective, pragmatic, decentralised, parallel group study in the UK recruiting adults with hypertension who are taking at least one antihypertensive medication and then randomised in a ratio of one to one to either have their usual antihypertensive medication in, in the morning or in the evening. Importantly, they weren't so interested in what the blood pressure was because ultimately what your blood pressure is doesn't really matter. It's what that does to you, what effect that leads to. Will that cause you to have a heart attack or a stroke or die so they didn't want to use blood pressure as a surrogate marker for their, for that. So that actually their primary endpoint was the was the rate of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for non-fatal myocardial infarction or non-fatal stroke. They also then looked for a load of secondary endpoints, a whole bunch of stuff, some of which they've already reported and some of which they're going to trickle out in um, X number of papers over the next few years. A few things to note about the population included in the study. So they were adults. Uh, the age ranged from 19 to 95, with the average age being 65. Just over half were male, but almost all of them were white. So 90% reported uh, their ethnicity as white. Only 0.5% of those included were black. And then just under 8% of participants the ethnicity was not reported. So we need to be a little bit cautious about how we apply the results of the study to our general population. The results were very simple. They found no difference between morning and evening dosing times in terms of heart attacks, strokes or cardiovascular events. It basically didn't make any difference in this study. The only differences that they did find, and these were small differences, was around the possible side effects that people reported. So if you were taking your medications in the morning, you're more likely to have dizziness or lightheadedness, upset stomach indigestion, diarrhea or muscle aches. If you're taking it in the evening, you're more likely to need to get up and go to the toilet at night. The authors conclude that this data suggests that it doesn't matter what time you take your blood pressure medications. Patients don't need to change the time at which they take them. Uh, and equally, if they prefer to take them at one time rather than another, perhaps because of these side effects in a, in a bid to minimise them, then that's okay too. The trial's not without its issues. As the linked editorial um, comments, the, the lack of racial diversity limits the generalizability of these results. And um, there were some issues around the level of adherence to the times that people had to take their medications. They were actually given quite broad time frames. So in the morning, you could take it any time between 6 and 10 a.m. in the evening, any time between 
8 and midnight. But even then, lots of patients failed to actually maintain doing that on a regular basis. So that may have affected some of the results. Nevertheless, for all the issues that have been highlighted, it is a well-conducted study and provides quite strong evidence on this topic. The difficulty for us as clinicians is knowing how to incorporate this into our practice, particularly in light of other studies that show something completely different. Is this study better than those? Is it a more valid result? Well, that's almost that kind of comment is almost not very helpful. This is one of the reasons why people do meta-analyses so that they can kind of collate things. But as the editorial points out, because of the issues around reliability of that Hygia trial, then actually maybe meta-analysis is inappropriate. Perhaps the best approach is, as Sarah, one of the GP trainers on the course yesterday, said to me, I've been in general practice long enough now to see things come back around. Sometimes doing nothing and not making any changes is the right thing to do. Personally, I'd be glad that we don't need to go and change thousands of our patients with blood pressure medication over to an evening dose. Okay, so our second study was in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is a Danish-based study. Denmark's got a very similar primary healthcare system to us in the UK here. So research that's conducted there is often very applicable to our practice. Now, of course, we get people in to do an NHS health check, and that's really focusing on cardiovascular risk. And we also know that despite the fact that we're still encouraged to do them, the data suggests that they don't really seem to work. So maybe we're just not doing enough. Maybe a few simple blood tests and a blood pressure check is inadequate. So in this Danish study, they went all in on doing cardiovascular screening. So not just blood tests, um, not just blood pressure. They also did a ankle brachial pressure index and you got a CT scan as well. Specifically, they did a non-contrast ECG gated CT. Sounds pretty cool. So what that allowed them to do is it allows them to, to check their coronary artery calcium score, look for aneurysms and atrial fibrillation. That ABPI looks for peripheral arterial disease and for hypertension. And the blood test looks for diabetes and hypercholesterolemia. So 46,000 men were recruited aged between 65 and 74 randomly assigned to either undergo this cardiovascular screening or to be in the control group. And the primary outcome was death. They followed these men up for five and a half years. And the bottom line is that screening made no difference. Now, it's a little hard to know whether the authors are just reaching for some positive outcome or is if there is more to this story than that. I think most of us would buy the idea that if you can intervene earlier in the development of cardiovascular disease, then you're more likely to be improving longer term outcomes for those patients. And the paper does show in one subgroup analysis of the under 70s that in that group, there does appear to be a statistically significant improvement with an 11% lower all cause death rate. Of course, that's nice to know. It'd be great to have that confirmed in another study. It would then be great to be able to actually act on that. And of course, I don't think in the UK, pretty much any of our patients have that opportunity, with the exception, of course, of when people come to us with the results of their private health checks. It still baffles me how many people's workplaces seem to pay for them to have a private health check, but don't pay for any follow up afterwards. This has led to several uncomfortable consultations in the past. Right. So it shows that your, uh, your, your coronary calcium score is raised. Okay. Let me just, um, Hey Siri, what is a coronary calcium score? A coronary CT calcium scan is a computed tomography scan of the heart for the assessment of severity of coronary artery disease. Damn it, Siri. That's not what I asked. Now you're making us both look like fools. So back to the study. So a negative finding with a slightly positive one, perhaps. Welcome to the world of medical research. I guess we'll just keep on plugging away at those NHS health checks. 
Okay, that's it for the research. A couple of shout outs for MB Medical. So do join us for our next free live clinic on uh, Tuesday, the 8th of November, 8 till 9 p.m. That's going to be on urological cancers uh, in conjunction with Cancer Research UK. Please do join us for that. Don't forget, you can also go back and watch On Demand, the clinic that I did last Tuesday, which was on um, the diagnosis and management of flares of inflammatory bowel disease disease. Don't forget to check out NB Plus, our subscription service, where for just over £300 a year, you get to come on all the courses that we do online, plus loads more besides. And don't forget, make sure you have some fun. Treat yourself. You're worth it. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Bye-bye.